and I was talking to my mentee just recently and um, I sent him a message. I was sending him a VN. I'm very notorious for sending voice notes um, because I express myself better talking. So I sent him a VN because he had sent me one earlier. And his message really touched my heart. And I had to send him a VN just telling him how much I appreciate him for seeing me. And he had reminded me of something I'd shared with the group or my, my mentoring group, I think last year or so. And I was very impressed that he remembered something I'd said a while ago. And he applied it to something that was happening currently in the world today. And that really touched my heart. It touched my heart because at the time he sent that VM, I was going through some limiting thoughts. I was having some self-doubt and really thinking, is anybody listening to the things I put out there, the things I share? I felt unheard and I felt ununderstood, uh, misunderstood. I felt like... Hmm, Nobody are not really listening. And when they are listening, immediately they listen. They tune on to the next person that is speaking because the world is full of so many speakers today. So when they listen to one, they're like, oh, that's, that, that makes a lot of sense. Then they tune the next minute to somebody else. So people go through like 10 at least speakers. Some of them are podcasters. Some of them are pastors. Some of them are motivational speakers. Some of them are influencers. But at the end of the day, when they go through that day, they really cannot remember what they might have heard on Pro Masterclass. Now, that concerns me a lot as a person because it just makes me feel this thing you're putting yourself into and trying to teach and trying to give hope and direction. Is it really hitting home? So when this my mentee sent this to me, I was very encouraged. I was very encouraged um, that... Somebody still remembers something from last year very accurately and can apply it to his life and his observation of the world at the moment. That, that sent massive encouragement to me and it just gave me strength to want to go back and continue to teach. Go back and just say, it's not over. Let's, let's not stop. If it's just this one person listening, it's good. And... Um, I sent him a message telling him how much that meant to me. And you see, where I'm going today is the fact that a lot of Christians, and I want to talk to Christians today, I want to talk to Christians today. And if you're a non-Christian, please feel free to listen to, because I, I believe non-Christians ought to know this. And there have been some non-Christians over time that understand what I'm about to say and they've said it to Christians. They've been the ones to try to teach Christians this. And Mahatma Gandhi was one of those people. He was not a Christian, but he understood what it meant to be a Christian. And the concept Gandhi understood was the fact that as Christians, we are not meant to be followers of Christ. As Christians, we are not meant to be followers of Christ. We are meant to be imitators of Christ. Imitators of Christ. We need to understand what an imitation is. Because I believe that a lot of Christians feel Christianity is about following a figure. But Christianity is about being a figure. It's about being a figure. And that's why Gandhi said, he has studied Christ. But if everyone that called themselves Christians were like this person that he has studied, the world will not be what it is today. Oh, 
What it means to be a Christian is to be a follower. It's not to be a follower, but to be an imitator. But a lot of Christians settle for being followers. And what does it mean to be an imitator? To be an imitator, number one, you must know the mode. There must be a mode. A mode that takes the form that every other imitation would take. There's a prototype mode. And Christ is that prototype mode. He is the mode. So when you go to the factory, there is a mode for the Coca-Cola bottle. There is, there is an original mode. Whenever they come up with a new design that they want, if you want to change the bottle, they will come up with one mode. One mode. There is one mode for Coca-Cola. One mode that every other bottle in the world must follow. And the truth of the matter is, those bottles do not really follow the mode. They become the mode. So when you look at all the Coca-Cola bottles, you should not be able to tell which one was the original one, which one was the prototype. Very hard to tell. Can you pick a Coca-Cola bottle and say this one is bottle number one or bottle number two or bottle number two million? They all look like the bottle. And that is what we are meant to be as Christians. Not followers, but imitations of Christ. We must be like Christ. And what that means is that we must see our lives as almost we are playing a game. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a big gamer, um, but my wife is. You know, in the days of, you know, Hitman. Very, very good at playing Hitman. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not good at gaming. So I've never been interested in gaming. Never been that interested because I'm not good at it. But I like to see people, watch people game. But then, you know, when my wife used to play, play Hitman, a game like Hitman or GTA, you see, you don't follow the character. They're not merely following the character. When you're playing a game, you become the character. There's no detachment between you and that character. You see the world through the eyes of that character. You become that character. So all the pre-designed foes, arc enemies of that character, that the designers of the game made for that character, don't become the enemies of the character. They become your enemies while you're playing that game. Because they're not just following. They're not trying to kill the character. They're trying to kill you. All the allies of the character, whether in GTA or in um, Hitman or game or any game like that, become your allies. You are not merely a spectator. You begin to experience life in the body of that character. This is what it means to be a Christian. You must begin to see yourself as Jesus in your own life. So you are not merely following Jesus. You have become the character of Jesus in the game of your own life. That is what it means. You become Jesus. And that's why it's very important for you as a Christian to study the Bible closely especially the Gospels that talk about Jesus. Because that is now you. That is who you have become. You are not just studying someone you are following. You are studying a life you should be living. His attitude becomes your attitude. His view of life becomes your view of life. His experience becomes your experience. You are not reading it like a story anymore. You are reading it as an instruction. A Christian is not a follower. A Christian, I'll say that and I hope it doesn't sound um, controversial, but I'll say it, that's the way I feel in my spirit. He's, a Christian is a forgery. 
now we see forgery as a as a as a, as a terrible word because people use it for crime but forgery the original term is not a terrible word it means it's forged in the image of something a christian is not a follower of christ a christian is the forgery of christ we are now forged to be like christ and that means where i'm really going is where you have to listen closely and why i talked about my mentee in the beginning it means you, now, you must now begin to spot as you read the bible who were the characters in jesus's life because those become the characters in your life too remember when you're playing game gta hitman there are characters the characters will not change for each player Everybody that comes will inherit the characters in the life of the character designed in GTA. The main character. You inherit the characters, immediately the characters in their life, whether the good or the bad characters. And that's why for everyone who is a Christian, remember now you've become Christ. And now that you've become Christ, what it means is you must now begin to cite in your life. Who is your John the Baptist? Who is your Peter? Who is your James and John? Very important. Who is your Judas? Who is your Paul? Who is your Mary Magdalene? Who are your Pharisees? Who is your Herod? And who is your pilot? Study the life of Christ and the characters in his life. And by doing so, you begin to study your life. And your eyes should become open to those characters in your life because they are there too. Remember, we are not following. The life is forged character for character, emotion for emotion, betrayal for betrayal, death for death, resurrection for resurrection. It's the same arc. It's the same character arc. It's not going to change. The same character arc. Wonders for wonders, miracles for miracles. The same character arc. Once you begin to realize that the life of Christ is not different from yours, you become a different kind of being. The one that Gandhi expected to see. And once that began to dawn on me as a person, my eyes started to open to the Peters in my life. Those people that when I ask, who do people say I am? Some people will tell me different things. But there's one person that sees who you truly are. By some revelation, sees who you truly are and values who you are. Hold on to that person. A lot of people have let their Peters go because they don't understand that they are forgeries of Jesus. So they just think their life, the, the arc of their life is separate from Jesus. It's not. Never let your Peter go. Pray for your Peter. Because the devil wants to save your Peter. And break his esteem or her esteem. When I say he, please, I'm not talking about, I'm not, talking, I'm not trying to be restrictive here, please. Him or her. Trying to break their esteem. Because I believe God doesn't see us as genders. He sees us as beings. The human being. So you look for your human being, Peter. Very important. Look for your human being, James and John. People don't understand why God took Peter, James and John. Wherever he was going, like those, those three were not missing. Peter was because he knew Peter really saw him. He knew Peter really saw him. So Peter helped Jesus build his esteem. A lot of people think Jesus had built esteem from the... No, no, Jesus was fully man. Helped him to build his esteem. 
talk about Jesus. Who do people say I am? At that point, Jesus was almost looking at us saying, do these people know who I am? Have I just been doing this thing for years without, without people really seeing me? Are they really paying attention? When Peter said it, he said, yes, God is in this one. And God is helping this one to really see. And I, be, I really believe that built Jesus' esteem. The Peters in your life, don't get rid of them. Pray for them. Take them with you as you go, please. Because when you are down, when you are down, you need a Peter. It's a rock. You need a Peter. James and John, those guys were very important. Because when you look at the life of Jesus, he was a very controversial character. Controversy is not a bad thing. Scandal is. Controversy is not a bad thing. Scandal is. A lot of people do not know how to tell the difference between controversy and scandal. So a lot of people, when you look at influencers and stuff, they say, man, I must get in the news. So I must kind of rile up some controversy. So what they do is stir up some scandal. Scandal smears you. Controversy makes people think. Controversy is not bad to be a controversial character. Not bad at all. Not bad. In fact, if there's nothing controversial about you, then you're questionable. It means you are a people pleaser. It means that you have no standards. Jesus was highly controversial. Controversial to the point that some people hated him. Now, we had these two brothers, James and John. No nonsense taken. They were out to defend his honor at all times. People don't understand that they almost acted as personal bodyguards to him. Personal bodyguards. They were with him everywhere. Not because they totally understood what he was saying. In fact, they were more about... In fact, when their mother came, they were like, please, when you start your kingdom, put these two beside you. They are more about ambition. Do you understand? They are more about ambition. But then, they loved everything Jesus was saying and they, they just knew that this guy, there was something to protect about him. You need those people in your life. People that will protect your honor. On any platform. Social media, people are trying to tear down your name. They will show up and say, no. I won't allow you to say this about this person. This person is my friend. I won't. When people are talking behind your back, they'll say, no, I won't join you in saying this. And I won't have you say this. Those people are very important. Sons of thunder. People that carry your matter on their head. <laughs> I remember once I, I had a, a live and someone was asking a question. And somebody in life kept on saying, you know, um, taller, 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 I don't agree, taller. And, you know, after, uh, while I was doing the live, someone sent me a message. One of my mentees sent me a message. I said, sir, I don't like that way. I don't like the way that guy is just calling you taller and just, that guy is a young guy now. That guy should show you some respect. I said, please just leave him. I want to listen to what he has to say. He said, I don't know, but that's really annoying me. You see, he had some kind of ginger. And I felt, this is my mentor. You can't talk to him anyhow. I have to control him and just say, you know, it's okay. You understand? It's okay. Allow him. You understand? Allow him talk. Because the way you see me, you see, I did a podcast on respect. The way you see me, not the way he sees me. You understand? I say, I, I, I tell him, cool down. Relax. Relax. It's all right. You know, sometimes eh, we have issues when people, you see, when people stand up for their pastors. Saying, what's wrong with you, Seth? What's wrong with you? Is he here? I remember when I, I went to, when I, while I was in school, I, I went to visit a roommate and we had gone to this lady's room where I was going to a particular fellowship, which is a big church in Nigeria. And we called her pastor by name. I said, no, don't call him, don't call him that. Call him pastor this. And in fact, I said, no, I don't like it. Why are you calling him that? If you saw him now, will you call him this? Would you call him by name? Call him Pastor This. And I, you know, at that point, I thought that was kind of fanatical. Eh? But then, when I thought about it, I'm like, oh, that's a true friend of that pastor. 
That's one that really defends his honor to the point of respect him even if he's not here because you wouldn't let me call your father by his name if he's not here. So I won't have you call him. You need James and John in your life. You need John the Baptist in your life. The human being of John the Baptist in your life, you need it. That person that has gone before you. I, I wrote that in a post once that some people have gone before you. Sometimes you have the opportunity to meet them. Sometimes you don't. Some people went almost a century before you. And it seemed like everything they wrote, everything they said was for you. Do you understand? Was to prepare you. Was to prepare people's minds for you. They came before technology. But they made the technology easy for you. Do you understand? Study. Study people that have lived before you. A lot of young people, the mistake they make is that they, they disregard older people. It's so unfortunate. We see them as outdated. We see them as um, unfashionable, boomer, slow. Oh, what You're missing so much. Love, you are missing out on your John the Baptist. See them as crude. They are crude. This man is poor now. Has nothing. Poor. See his dress sense. Rubbish. No. Hmm. Those people, they're preparing for you. Preparing the way for you. They believe in you so much. They're preparing for you. I have a father-in-law. <laughs> Plays a very important role in my life. My father-in-law. He's, he's my father in law by um, the fact that he's father to my sister's husband. So he's not even my wife's father. He's the father to my sister's husband. I know when I started to write, and I wasn't even writing anything, I was just sharing my mind, you understand? This man, who is in his 80s now, always used to comment, always, when nobody was commenting on my work. Nobody. Absolutely nobody. This guy would read, and at first I thought this guy was whining me. But then he always to read and just say, Thank you, my philosopher. This makes so much sense to me. Thank you, my philosopher. And he used to write it, the philosopher of our age. The philosopher of our age. I used to feel, ah, why is this man saying all these grand things? Like, this, this man is just giving me old man wine. But then, every time he would speak to my sister, he would say, please greet my philosopher for me. I love what he writes. It makes so much sense. When he talks to my parents, who didn't understand what I was doing for a very long time? They don't understand. They tell her, what are you doing? What is all this thing you are doing? I don't understand. Some people are just following you. People will say we should greet you. But the one that really hit them was this man who was older than them told them what your son is doing is very good. He's writing about some things that he shouldn't know. Greet my philosopher. Then I realized this guy was serious. I realized he was serious. And I started to pay attention to his words. He became like a John the Baptist to me. Way ahead of me, but then validating what I was doing. If things go out, pan out right, he will go before me. But I will never forget him. Never. For those simple words, the philosopher of our age. He made me go back and buy philosophy books and really study who are philosophers. So I went there and bought some books about stories, about stoics and stuff, and I read about stuff and I'm like, okay, these guys, these guys are kind of modeling the kind of life I'm trying to live. You understand? Having unique thoughts and stuff. And it made me just at that point I was dealing with, I was dealing with this insecurity of going from design to being a thought leader. And I was like, Tola, what does this mean? But then those, that man helped me with his words. Just say, it's okay. Embrace it. It's a good thing. Find your John the Baptist. Find your Paul. Now, Paul is a very interesting character who never met Jesus physically. But find your Paul. Paul did more pre-Jesus than any other person. I mean, post-Jesus than any other person. Any other person alive till date did more for Christianity. Now, but Paul didn't start out that way. Paul started out 
opposing and he started out resisting. One thing about I realized after studying people, great people, and after you know, going through this, parent, this, this journey of parenting, I realized that for a lot of us, our pause will be our children. Our children, maybe our grandchildren. Don't get discouraged when your children resist what you're doing. Sometimes they won't spite it. Don't get discouraged. I remember going to a museum, the Yaradwa um, Museum of Arts, or Yaradwa Museum in um, Abuja here. If you come to Abuja, I encourage that you go to that place and just check it out. And just check out some Nigerian history, um, the Yaradwa Center. Beautiful place, well laid out museum. And they take you around this life of this um, man called Sheo Musa Yaradwa. And, um, you know, he's late now. But then, you know, he was one of the four forerunners of Nigeria. And um, when you go through the museum, they tell you a story, they curate everything about him from his secondary school uniform, to his first army uniform, to what he wore when he was turbaned, you know, was given a title in the north, to every single thing, well detailed. But when you are getting to the end, there's a part where he wrote a letter to his son. And at this point, he was expressing some discouragement towards his son and an unhappiness. And he told his son, I heard you're not doing well in school. You're not paying attention. I heard you're not standing for a lot of what I'm standing for as your father. And his son had told him, son told him, look, because you were never there for us, you were busy fighting this cause of this thing called Nigeria. Why would I want to be like you? I don't see you as a father. And so I don't want to walk this path of being a statesman. And I'm sure this really broke his father's heart. So he, he, he felt, oh, everything I was doing. He wrote in a letter asking for the boy to be brought to him in prison because at that point, Yaradwa was in prison and wanted to talk to his son physically. We don't know what the outcome of that meeting was. But then it must have stung really hard to have your son saying he didn't want to walk in your footsteps. Now, sometimes you have people, especially very close people, that should know better. And a lot of times it might be your, your child. That's why you should, be, you should be so critical when we have people who might be ministers. Um, when I talk about ministers, I'm talking about church ministers, you know, what we might refer to as men of God, um, leaders, and their, their children just seem to be going the wrong way. And we get very judgmental of them. I used to be that way. But then we realize that sometimes the Paul is the rebel. That seems like he's counter what you are doing. And sometimes that is as close as your child. Like your child, first daughter, first son. You're like, ah, carry on this legacy. I ain't carrying on anything. They are trying to destroy it. Just remember that there's always a Paul that seems to be persecuting Christ. Don't stop showing them love. Never ever cast them away. Don't stop showing them love. In the end, Jesus had an encounter with Paul. And I had to ask him, why are you doing this to me? At that Paul, at that point, Paul understood who Jesus was. And he became one of the greatest, greatest, greatest characters in the Bible that lived after Jesus. Greatest. Look out for your Paul. Look out for people that support you. With their means, look out for them. 
They're able to allow you to do those things that you feel called to do. Because of the way you were able to help them at some point in their lives or the other. Jesus had those people in his life. With their personal means. Look out for them. They are there. People that pay close attention. The Mary Magdalene's. They leave everything they are doing to listen. To what you do. To pay attention to you. Look out for them. They were in Jesus' life. They are in your life. The same character arc. Look out for the Pharisees. They are always asking you to prove yourself. Their report is always one negative. They are always bringing the standards and telling you how you are a troublesome person. They invite you to their houses but they are trying to trap you. Sometimes they will provide some things for you. The Pharisees provided meals for Jesus, lavish meals. Didn't mean they loved him. Be careful of them. Always asking you questions to prove yourself. Don't feel the need to always answer their questions. Are you sure? Explain this. Do you really mean this? They are cynical. Every single thing. And But this person said this. But you said this last year. Why are you contradicting yourself? Do you understand? Don't, don't fall prey to the Pharisees. People that tell you, which school did you go to? We, we went to school. Which school did you go to? What degree do you have? What gives you a right? Don't try explaining to them. Sometimes, they might be there in your audience. Whatever you are doing, they are there in your audience. They are watching. Not asking, not interacting, just watching for you to slip up. Asking you questions that seem like, oh, we're going to get you now, we're going to get you, we're going to get you. Sometimes ask them questions back. Pharisees, they are there. But I want to end with Judas. Identify the Judas in your life. This is very important. Highly important. Those people that hang around and seem like they love you. Those people for whom the line between admiration and envy is very blurry. As a matter of fact, when they come, they come with admiration. But very easily, they look at you and they say, why should you have what you have? Why? And they look at themselves and like, this, this is, um, I should have this thing rather than this person. This person is undeserving of what they have. They are underutilizing it. You can see it. You see, the problem is a lot of us, we listen with our ears, not our spirit. So we cannot identify Judas's. Because they say the complimentary words. They say good things. But then you're not reading their energy. We always get hurt when we hold on to people's words but dismiss their energy. The energy. The energy. God, help us to be able to listen and feel the energy. Only a spiritual person can. Words don't convey a man's heart. It's the energy. You cannot explain it. It's an energy. Identify the Judas that are going around with you. They seem to be cheering. They seem to want to serve with you. Take note of those slight comments. Ah, are you sure? Are you sure you are doing this thing the right way? So? If it were me, all those people that come and keep saying, if it were me, if it were me, I would have done it better. There's some envy there. People that always show up to correct, but never show up to validate. Be very careful of them. When you make mistakes, they're always there. 
okay you made a mistake here spelling error you did this oh you were wrong about this your information was wrong your research wasn't right i write a lot i have people that don't even know they read my writing i don't even know they listen to my podcast but the one the very one where my statistic is wrong where this research is not done right that's when that person would always show up you you, you were wrong here you were wrong here i'm like ah after all the 50, I never knew you were with me, but then people that always show up for correction and not correction in love, correction to shame you. So even when they show up to correct, it's not privately, it's on that social media comment section that they will come and correct. Be careful. Remember, as a Christian, your life is not one of following. Is of one of forging. Forging to be in the mode of the prototype. Study the prototype. Know the character arc. And know where your life is going. And know who is going with you. My name is Tola T.A. Alabi. And you've been listening to my podcast, Pro Up Masterclass.